and welcome back to HackMyControlSystem.com. My name is Nate and thank you for viewing. Our last episode we talked about what Modbus is, um, how it can be communicated over different protocols. Let's see, what do we come up with? RS-232, 422, FAR-85, Modbus over TCP, Modbus TCP, Modbus over UDP, and Modbus RTU over IP. This video will focus on Modbus transported over Ethernet IP networks and how to detect Modbus devices on the local area network or just directly connected to the internet. If you recall in our last episode, SCADA Strangelove noted 7.4% of ICS devices on the internet were Modbus. There are also online resources available to us for validating such findings. The Sands Institute's Internet Storm Center reports pro port and protocol activity over time as observed by internet connected sensors and these can be firewalls, intrusion prevention systems, or just honeypots. Although the data for Modbus TCP is not even two years old, we can see a lot of activity within the yellow-orange line indicating traffic sourced from TCP port 502 or those devices receiving Modbus traffic noted in blue. Shodan is a website that presents its network scan findings, meaning what systems are connected to the internet. This can be your home router, your company's web server, or a Siemens S7 programmable logic controller. This takes the guesswork of identifying connected systems. Its ICS radar page reveals the count of Modbus responses it's observed. The number is the second highest. You can view some of the responses for Modbus in this screenshot. Note that Shodan will not allow you to use advanced query terms unless you have a subscription. A simpler way is to simply use Google search terms. For example, here's the login URI for a Siemens S7 1500. Or, my personal favorite, look for disclosed SCADA URLs, but they are often honeypots. If the attacker is on the local area network, his or her best course of action is to lie low and passively sniff traffic noting the address space, monitoring broadcast traffic for clues, and even correlating Layer 2 Ethernet MAC addresses with their manufacturers. I like to use a network protocol analyzer to detect devices that are auto-broadcasting and identify network-related protocols that can help me understand its addressing schema. Any Layer 2 MAC addresses identified could be resolved either through Wireshark or simply querying it on the Internet. An example of the site is HTTP, www.macvendorlookup.com. If you do not have access to an ICS testbed, you can still leverage some publicly available ICS-specific PCAP files. For example, NetRecSec has made available their capture files from a 4S ICS Geek Lounge, and Digital Bond published theirs from an S415 ICS Capture the Flag event. Links are included within the show notes. As homework, try to use Google search terms to crawl cloudshark.org results for all their Modbus packets. Although any protocol analyzer, command line, or GUI will work, I will use Wireshark to obtain some quick statistics about the capture file. Alright, first thing we do, we can use uh, Wireshark's cap infos tool to go ahead and get some metadata information about our particular capture file. We can see the file size, the capture name, but more importantly, when the first and last packet was captured, that's going to give us an idea of duration. We can then open that in, excuse me, don't need pseudo privileges. You can then go ahead and read that uh, capture file in Wireshark. I'll go ahead and fork the process. Then we can get the similar information through statistics, capture file properties, the elapsed time is a little easier to read. And if we scroll down, we can actually get the average uh, bits, bytes per second. It gives you an idea of our throughput in that particular uh, network segment. We can store file or comments on the particular file. If uh, we do actually include additional commentary uh, within the PCAP file, we need to save it as a PCAP NG format. NG stands for next generation. Now we have two options, right? We can reduce the amount of displayed traffic to that of Modbus using a regular display filter such as TCP port 
502. Double equal signs. That always helps. Alternatively, we can go to statistics, protocol hierarchy, right click on Modbus TCP, apply as filter, select it, close this, and we have a much cleaner, um, uh, cleaner view into the network traffic where we're just showing Modbus encapsulated within TCP. Of course, you could simply just put uh, MBTCP as an expression, just showing you different options. We can also add additional display filters such as Modbus encapsulated within TCP, but I want to see the unit ID and make that equal to one. And that's going to show us all the Modbus traffic where unit identifier or slave ID of one was used. We could further define that. Let's do that. Modbus. There we go. Modbus function code equals 17. Go to apply that. And that is going to provide us with all the traffic where there was a match of function code 17. As you can see, we have uh, that being issued by our attacker VM, which is 192.168.1.242. So far, we've used a software running in a virtual environment, uh, with the exception of this Arduino Omega. Let's up the ante by introducing some low-cost hardware. I have here a web switch remote power switch. It's going to act as our Modbus server, which is Modbus TCP speak for slave. It communicates over Ethernet IP using TCP, uh, TCP port 502, and its registers interact with these outlets so you can turn it on and off using the Modbus uh, master. Before we begin the actual demonstrations, let's take a moment to review our testing topology. I've tried to keep it low cost, and as a result, it's a mixture of hardware, software emulation, and virtual machines. The first hardware device is a powered web switch acting as a Modbus server. We can actually turn the outlets on or off by writing to its coils. It has an embedded web server, and this will act as our human machine interface, or HMI. It's connected over copper cabling to a 5-port Hirschman switch powered by a Hirschman 24 volt DC inverter. I also have an older Raspberry Pi Model B powered by one of the web switch's outlets. The Pi is simply running Compot with a default template. You can see the CLI output as I have SSH'd in from the victim machine. The victim virtual machine is running Modbus PAL and a simulated 110 volt AC voltage regulator. We can review the holding registers and see that there are three constant output voltage alarms and a randomized input voltage value to simulate power measurement. This software is being hosted on the victim VN, which is just a clone of the attacker VM. Both VMs have their interfaces bridged and connected to the Hirschman switch through an OpenWRT flash router. The router isn't necessary, rather a convenience, as it was easier than statically configuring the addresses. Before we begin, let's start the Metasploit framework on the target machine as it can take some time to load. So now that we have Metasploit loaded, let's go ahead and sweep the IP target IP space to find what machines are actually connected. I'm going to show you two ways to do that. Uh, the first will be through Metasploit, and then we'll actually use InMap to verify it using a different technique, a simple ICMP echo request ping suite. But for now, let's go ahead and use the auxiliary ARP suite module found under auxiliary, scanner, discovery, and we'll type in ARP suite. Let's show our options. We can go ahead and set our interface value 
And unlike other systems, which is E0, we have this bridged. This will be EMP 0S3. You can go ahead and find that by opening up a terminal in a Linux system, typing in ifconfig, or if you're in a Windows system, you could type ipconfig. And anytime you set a value, it's pretty much you know consistent to um, within the space of that module. We want to make it globally, so it doesn't ask for it again. So we'll go ahead and append a G for global. Now we'll go ahead and set the IP space. And then we'll increase the verbosity and run the module. First result we received, dot one, is our OpenWRT router. We could have easily identified that as well um, by looking at our gateway address within either terminal or the command prompt. Dot two is the web switch. Dot 142 is the victim of machine. Dot 179 is the actual laptop itself. 242, the Raspberry Pi, and 246 is my attacker machine. So the systems that I'm interested in scanning is the web switch, dot two, our VM, and the Raspberry Pi. And I've simply just copied them, pasted them into a target list, and cleaned it up. Now we'll go ahead and run an ICMP echo request ping sweep over IP uh, just to see if those particular if we could identify any additional systems. So we'll want to launch this with pseudo privileges because if we don't it will default to a TCP ping sweep instead of ICMP. We'll then call inmap, say that we want to do a ping sweep without DNS name resolution specify ICMP echo requests. Instead of giving it a target range, we'll go ahead and provide it with our input target list. And then we will grep for the word report. And then we'll only pass the IPs as output. And if we compare the output of the ICMP scan uh, with the actual ARP sweep, we can see that uh, we have the same results. Now we can actually start um, scanning the network looking for Modbus TCP devices on the wire. We know what our IP target list is, 2, 142, and 242. So we'll go ahead, can call in map. We'll say skip doing um, ping sweeps or ICMP echo requests and assume all systems are up. We will then use a connect scan, which I know we wouldn't actually need pseudo privileges to run, but just uh, out of muscle memory. We'll slow our timing down. We won't do DNS name resolution. We'll double our verbosity. We will not send IP packets. We'll send Ethernet packets as we're on the local subnet, and we'll send them to TCP port 502, which as you're aware is the Modbus port. We're going to attack the reason flag on there. Um, and if I was using a full subnet, uh, then I would use the uh, hyphen hyphen open flag just to show me those uh, those uh, responses that actually had an open port. But since we know which systems we want to target, I'm substituting it with the reason because I want to see if there's an issue. For example, the port's closed, meaning that earlier scanning might have brought it down or port might have been changed, etc. As best practice, we'll go ahead and add it a scan delay of one, and then we're be gonna we're gonna go ahead and call uh, call a additional inmap script, which is Modbus Discover, to get us a little bit more information. We then have to specify our interface, and then we're gonna output that information into temp Modbus XML, and use our IP target list. And let's begin. And that was pretty quick. 
So I'll start from the top. We have our web switch responding to TCP port uh, 502 connection. So that's great. We got a SYNAC back. However, we got no information um, out of our Modbus Discover script. The same can be said for our virtual machine, but we know it's open. However, we did get some data uh, out of our scans against a PLC. As you can see here, the Modbus script was able to pull up that this is in fact a Siemens Somatic S7200, which we know it's just a honeypot, but hey, the script's working. So where are these scripts located at? You can actually find them in user, share, in map, scripts. And for this case, let's we'll go ahead and grab everything with mod, short for Modbus. Uh, and we see that we have a couple scripts here. We have the Modbus Discover. And we also see a Modicon Info. And we manually imported this script, um, which isn't really hard to do. Within our offense uh, directory, we grab some in-map scripts from Redpoint. And from another place, I'd have to look in the GitHub uh, information where I found that. But all we have to do is just copy those to the directories I showed you within user share in-map scripts. So now we're uh, going to go ahead and start getting information on these devices. And I'm going to walk you through the syntax for, you know, try to map one particular platform to one command. Um, if there is some sort of disp uh, discrepancy between the output reporting, then I'll run the command um, a couple of times using different IPs. So all the enumeration scripts are listed with under the offense directory. The first one we're going to use is PLC scan. And PLC scan actually allows us to interact both with Modbus as well as the Siemens um, S7 protocol. If we don't want to send arbitrary packets, We can go ahead and specify an IP followed by the colon and then the actual port. So now we're only going to specify port 502 uh, for Modbus. And we see we got some illegal function codes. Very interesting. How about if I ran that with a different script? SCADA scan. And we'll simply call this Perl script. And then we'll point out the same IP. And it returned to us the monet unit, uh, Modbus unit ID 0. We didn't get any errors, so that's good. So that verifies earlier finding. We see there's a folder for mod scan. And I'll go ahead and call that specify port 502. We'll make it aggressive and leverage function code 17. And let's point it at our web switch. An alternative to using these scripts to identify target hosts we could return back to Metasploit and use the Modbus Detect script found under Auxiliary, Scanner, SCADA. Let's show the options. We can set the R hosts.
and then this time we'll specify uh, excuse me subnet and note we have unit ID set to one let's go ahead and run this we immediately get a response back from the web switch all right well if you looked at the little clock on the bottom right hand corner you can see that really took a long time so my recommendations is if once you identify which Modbus targets you have it would be much quicker if you would actually specify the R host as a single IP instead of running the whole class C. An automated method of deducing what the device unit ID is is to use Metasploit's auxiliary Modbus find unit ID located within auxiliary, scanner, SCADA, and then type in the module unit ID. Show our options. We can see we need to specify an R host. And for this particular demonstration, I'm going to use my bus pal. And then we'll run it, and it will essentially, uh, with a um, with a, a certain timeout, I think two two seconds, two second timeout, uh, it will iterate from unit ID one to two fifty four. And we can see that um, one forty two responded in kind to, "Hey, I'm running on uh, station ID one." Once the device is identified, you just don't start sending it arbitrary packets. So review the documentation once you know what device it is. Um, within the web switch manual, we can see that it has a bunch of function codes and addresses. We have completed our reconnaissance and network scanning phases. Prior to moving on to enumeration and modification of Modbus coils and registers, let's talk about these situations where you have mixed protocols in the same network. For example, Modbus Plus and Ethernet Industrial Protocol. To get disparate protocols communicating, you can add a gateway to perform protocol conversion. Let's take a quick look at ProSoft's Modbus Plus to Ethernet IP Gateway. Remember the IP stands for Industrial Protocol, not Internet Protocol. It's easy to identify which is which simply by looking for the capital N in Ethernet, meaning this is Ethernet Industrial Protocol. Here we also have a Modbus RTU to Modbus TCP IP gateway and a ProSoft Modbus TCP IP to DMP3 over Ethernet gateway. We will discuss DMP and its use in electrical substations in a subsequent video series. It's not uncommon for ICS network devices to have their MAC or IP addresses written on it, making this low-hanging fruit for attackers. This is another example for the importance of physical security in locked cabinets. Now let's wrap up by covering the key takeaways of this episode from a cybersecurity perspective. If you need to connect devices to the internet, implement additional security, such as firewalls, VPN, strong encryption, ACLs, and authentication. Even better, implement a jump box in an ICSDMZ for secure remote access. We'll cover this in detail in a later episode. Like its serial predecessor, Modbus TCP locks authentication or replay protection, meaning anyone on the LAN can capture, modify, and replay commands to the Modbus servers. Network access control or even rudimentary, rudimentary port security can help minimize the risk of rogue devices on your network. Using protocol gateways to connect field bus to IP networks is a double-edged sword. It affords the devices the means to communicate over disparate networks, but it also allows attackers the same access. As a result, network segmentation and inspection should be considered. That concludes this episode. We discovered Modbus devices directly connected to the internet, identified them in packet captures, even discovered them via network scans. In the next episode, we'll cover enumerating and modifying Modbus coils and registers. We thank you for viewing and ask that you subscribe by pressing the subscribe link below. Lastly, please note that we've listed our references in the show notes.